Hello, and welcome to episode 516 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan, as always, joined by Evan Silva. The regular season is over. The playoffs are upon us. Evan, how do you feel? I feel pretty good. Um, I, I went big on Georgia last night um, to, to cover, and they easily did, and got the Jamal Williams rushing touchdown lead. So it was it was a good week for me. I, I I've been having it was a good finish to the season. Jamal Williams without a sweat didn't even need to sweat yeah. it. Well, yeah, I mean it was so smooth. I mean I I was really worried about Derrick Henry on Saturday night, mm-hmm. um, but the Jaguars did an awesome job defending him from the jump. Like they were in the backfield, you know, for the majority of that game. Derrick Henry had like one good run, really the entire game. Um, and then Austin Eckler, I was surprised that, well, we'll talk about the Chargers, but really surprised that they played starters. Yep. Um, and then uh, and then Jalen Hurts, you know, he he didn't get there. So And Jamal Williams, he wound up winning comfortably because he scored two in the Sunday night upset of Green Bay. Yep, unbelievable. And everybody loves Jamal Williams now. What a year for him. Lead the league in rushing touchdowns, become the president of Team Sex. Even mentioned me on his Instagram. You know, what a year overall for Jamal Williams. On today's show, we are going to go team by team through each playoff squad, talking about some little bit what we saw in week 18, week 17, what it means going forward for these playoff squads. Before we get into it, I have to remind everyone, this podcast is indeed brought to you by our friends at Underdog Fantasy, this playoff-only best ball tournament they're running. It's called The Gauntlet, or they have all kinds of different ones, but one is called The Gauntlet, and it is so, so, so fun to draft teams that you think can get four, five, even six guys on your team through the first few rounds and into the Super Bowl, which will, which will be what you need to win the Super Bowl. I think we do have rankings up on the site for those. They're updated. We do have content, podcasts, and articles up as well on optimal strategy for that format. If you have not tried Underdog Fantasy yet, promo code ETR when you sign up will match your first deposit up to $100. Again, promo code ETR at Underdog Fantasy. Dot com. Let's start with the Dallas Cowboys here. Evan, Dallas Cowboys are going to limp into the playoffs. They tried in this game. I mean, they seem to want to win this game. They had an outside shot, a very outside shot at getting up as high as the top seed. But no, they are going to go to play at the Bucks in the first round of the playoffs on Monday night. Dallas got absolutely worked by a dead commander's team led by Sam Howell. Again, Dallas played their starters. Dak was just absolutely atrocious. Do you think this is signal here, Evan, or maybe they were just looking ahead to the playoffs? And what do you think about Dallas as we get set for their game against the Bucs? Well, they haven't been playing good football for like almost a month and a half at this point because they just got smoked by the commanders while playing their starters. Uh, The week before that, they, you know, they, they let the Titans hang in that game uh, on Thursday night. Um, Week before that, they beat Gardner Minshew by six points. The week before that, they lost to the Jaguars, and the week before that, they barely beat the Texans. So this is, I mean, it's it's kind of concerning, and their their defense isn't remotely where it was earlier in the season. Dak, I think, has played well for the most part. He did not play well in the final game, though, and um, you know, Tony Pollard isn't one hundred percent. I mean, it's. It's, it's a little concerning right now for Dallas. Yeah, um, Bucks are mega live to win this game. Obviously, this game will be played in Tampa as a result of the Bucks winning the division. Um, I want, from a usage perspective, one thing I'd say in this game is T.Y. Hilton got up to 16 routes. That was a season high for him. I mean, they clearly like him and clearly like using him. Noah Brown ended up running 31 routes in this game, but T.Y. Hilton on these small slates and a lot of the DFS slates this weekend, they're going to be small, you know, Saturday only, Sunday only, Monday night showdown. T.Y. Helton will certainly be in play there. I know it's not um, part of Dallas, and we're not we're talking about playoff teams, but I'm just curious what you thought of Sam Howell. Like, I thought they should have given Sam Howell a chance way sooner. I mean, mm-hmm. Carson Wentz, obviously not it. Uh, they didn't want to play Terry, uh, uh, Taylor Heineke in that big game that they had in Week 17. Why not give Sam Howell a chance, man? I thought he showed – he wasn't great, but I thought he showed that he at least has mm-hmm. some potential. What were your thoughts on his first NFL start? I mean, he had 11 completions, you yeah. know, and he, he got sacked three times on uh, 22 dropbacks. But, I mean, he could throw the ball downfield. He's plenty athletic. He's willing to run. Um, and 
it seems like everybody that plays quarterback for Washington knows how to get the ball to Terry McLaurin, except for Carson Wentz. Yeah. You know, because that was, um, that was Sam Howell's number one target in this game. And um, I mean, I, I think he's got potential. He's just, you know, he's a fifth round pick yeah. and that's, that's always going to work against him. Um, but, you know, at the same time, like Washington isn't going to have what a super high draft pick. Yeah. I mean, they finished eight, eight and one. Right. So, I mean, I think that Sam Howell is going to be in the mix to be their starter next season. I think he'll probably be the underdog in some kind of a competition. Yeah, I mean, clearly they still need to address the position in the mm-hmm. offseason. There's no doubt about that. Let's go to Minnesota. So the talk around the Minnesota game in Week 18 was, will they go to try to get the record for Justin Jefferson? It looked like they were trying to get the record for K.J. Osborne. I mean, the starters only played about a half. K.J. Osborne caught five balls for 117 yards. Justin Jefferson, four catches for 38 yards. So a lot of the incentive stuff went really bad uh, this past week. Teams did not seem to be interested in it at all. They were not interested in going for the Justin Jefferson one. Clearly, two straight kind of rough games for Justin Jefferson now, but Vikings players only played a half. They obviously did not really care too much about the game. What do you think of the Vikings' performance? Any thoughts on them? Their first playoff game is a home game against the New York Giants. Yeah, I mean, I thought that they'd give it more, more of a shot uh, to try to get the record for Justin Jefferson. Um, but they really didn't make any effort to do that at all. Um, Dalvin Cook got banged up in the game. Alexander Madison came in, wound up having a big game. Um, I, I think Dalvin Cook – yeah, Dalvin Cook returned. Correct. Though, and I think he's he should be fine for uh, the, the the first round of the playoffs. I'm, st- I'm concerned about the Vikings, though. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't think that – you know they're 27th in football outsiders DVOA. Yeah. 27th uh they lost brian o'neill late in the season to a year-ending injury that he may be he may be he's arguably their best offensive lineman that's something that could come back to haunt him and their pass defense and it wasn't tested here obviously by nathan peterman and tim boyle but their pass defense is a real real big problem the vikings are playing the giants the giants played them really close on what i think it was christmas eve and daniel jones lit them up yeah so I mean, I, I, I think the Giants. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it more on on Friday and everything. But like, I think that the the Vikings are very live to be upset by the Giants. Yeah, only a three point uh, spread there between the Giants and the Vikings, even though the game is in Minnesota. That first game when they played in Week 16, Minnesota won 27-24. Maybe a small difference in this game. Irv Smith got back finally for the Vikings here. Irv Smith ran 12 routes, did earn three targets, three fourteen zero. Obviously, they have T.J. Hawkinson now, and so Irv Smith's role is going to be. Muted, but I just wanted to put it out there that Irv Smith is indeed back. Giants. So Giants did the right thing, I think, and rested all of their guys. Uh, Saquon didn't play. Daniel Jones didn't play. Most of the starters didn't play. I will say, though, man, like, and, and I obviously I love Daniel Jones. Been talking about him forever. But this might be one of the least talented teams in the playoffs ever. Like, they are, do not have a lot of talent. Doesn't mean they're not good or decent or whatever. They just don't have a lot of talent. That's a shout out. To Brian Dayball, which I want to get to the coach of the race year race here in a second. But even with this lack of talent, like Evan just said, they can go and win a playoff game. I mean, they're playing at Minnesota. They can certainly, certainly, certainly win that game. Anyways, Evan, I know you put out your coach of the year pick maybe a few weeks ago. Yeah. You had Campbell at that point. Now Campbell has not made the playoffs. Dayball has made the playoffs. Any thoughts on the Giants here and who is now your pick for coach of the year? Well, I'm very biased here because I went back and looked at my my long shot futures from before the season, and like I did a lot of day bowl. I did yeah. a lot of day bowl to be uh, coach of the year, and I hit him recently too when he was at four to one. Um, so I'm very very biased, uh, and I think that Doug Peterson absolutely deserves serious consideration, as does Kyle Shanahan. I think Nick Sirianni does, but he's at the back end of that list. Um, I don't know. Do you have odds up right now for where we're at on the coach of the year? I don't have odds, but I, I really think it's five guys. I think it's either Sirianni, Kyle Shanahan, Doug Peterson, Brian Dable, or Dan Campbell. Um, I think it's one of those five guys. I, I don't, I don't want to discount Nick Sirianni, in other words, like penalize guys too much for having such a loaded team. But I do think you have to penalize him to some degree there. And that goes to Kyle Shanahan as well. I mean, the San Francisco has outrageous talent now winning with Jimmy Garoppolo and Brock Purdy maybe makes Kasha in a bit more deserving. But in my opinion, and you know, obviously, like I stand to win a lot if Dan Campbell wins, but I still think that if I had a vote, I would vote for 
Brian Dable, like I said, one of the least talented teams I've ever seen in the NFL playoffs. Bar none has done the most with the least. Yeah. Brian Dayball this year. And is that the criteria? You know, it doesn't say exactly what the criteria is, you know, but I think most with the least is a good criteria, at least for me, for coach of the year. That to me, that's the hardest job in coaching. Let's go to Eagles. Eagles are not playing their best football right now, man. I mean, they were, did, maybe they peaked too soon. And honestly, they kind of got thrown off the tracks a little bit when Jalen Hurts got hurt. And maybe they'll take this week off and get the ship right and come back out flying like they were at the beginning of the year. But this was not a great performance. I mean, they were playing the Giants backups, the Giants junior varsity squad, and they did not play well. They had long drives, but they could not finish them. Jalen Hurts was not great. They only let him do five designed runs in this game. Do you have any concern on the Eagles here? And by the way, I should add that odds to make the Super Bowl at an NFC, even though the Eagles have a bye, them and San Francisco have the same price. They were both around plus 175. Last I checked. So how concerned are you about the Eagles as they head into the playoffs here? Again, they do have a bye week. Well, I think that they definitely need this bye. Um, I think that, you know, uh, and, you know, we talked about like how in previous years, like the Eagles have for a long time, really since their their Super Bowl win. And e even then, I mean, they lost Carson Wentz when he was playing the best football of his career. They have long struggled with injuries. But this year, they were one of the healthiest teams in the NFL until everything kind of kind of fell apart a little bit for the final few weeks. Jalen Hurts, Lane Johnson, you know, Jalen Hurts is going to be healthier after this bye week. Lane Johnson, I think, is expected to be back. Miles Sanders dealt with that knee thing, you know. Um, uh, oh, and then uh, on defense, they got back Ch uh, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson and Robert Quinn. They activated them off IR. For week 18, they might get Avante Maddox back, mm -hmm. their slot corner from a toe injury. They've been getting killed in the middle of the field. So I just think that, I mean, yeah, I'm concerned, but like they're going to be a lot healthier, I think, on the on the other side of this bye. They needed this. Yeah, I think that's a great point. They can certainly, certainly, certainly get a lot healthier. That'll make a big difference. You mentioned Miles Sanders. Even in this game, they had to win. I was a little surprised. Miles Sanders, only 11 out of 25 running back carries. Boston Scott got nine. Kenny Gainwell, five. I think in the playoffs, we'll see Miles get a way bigger portion of that, and Boston Scott won't play very much. But I think it's at least worth noting there. Eagles have no idea who they're going to play. They're going to play the lowest remaining seed, obviously. Could be Cowboys, could be Giants, could be Bucks, could be Seahawks. So we'll see who the Eagles match up with in the divisional round. San Francisco, another win for Brock Purdy, man. Big Cock Brock is now 6-0 as a starter for San Francisco 49ers. We've talked so much about how loaded this team is on both sides of the ball, arguably the best defense in the NFL. And now with Debo back, Eli Mitchell back, CMC looks fine, Kittle is peaking, Ayuk is a baller. I mean, you could also make cases one of the most talented offenses in the entire NFL. And so even though they have to play an, an extra game on top of Philly, they still have the same price, like I just mentioned. And so 49ers are a very, very, very good team. They absolutely smoked the Cardinals unsurprisingly, in week 18 to clinch that number two seed. What do you see out of that, Evan? Anything else on the 49ers? Yeah, and I think that Elijah Mitchell coming back is like kind of a low-key big deal mm -hmm. uh, for San Francisco. They can absolutely dominate you on the ground. They don't want to give Christian McCaffrey 25 carries every game. They probably do want to get him 20 touches every game, but they can use Elijah Mitchell as a change of pace, as a breather back. They could use Elijah Mitchell on the field at the same time as Christian McCaffrey when Christian – Christian McCaffrey splits out and plays receiver. Debo's coming back. I mean, they are at the right the, – they're on the right side right now of the injury variants. And Elijah Mitchell, I I really liked him in DFS this week. Obviously got really lucky, two touchdowns yeah. on five carries. But, I mean, he was shot out of a cannon. Yeah. He's got the fresh legs late in the season. You know, I think I, I think he's an interesting, like, best ball pick in – these um you know these play these uh these fantasy playoff tournaments, um and I, I think that he's going to be good for seven to eleven carries per game, and they're going to be quality carries. I mean Elijah Mitchell is really good. I love that as for your playoff contest, the Eli Mitchell call because Kyle Shanahan's obsessed with this dude. You remember going back to last year, Kyle Shanahan could not stop raving about this dude, playing him in spots where we didn't think that he would play him, and yeah, you know you saw him score two touchdowns on five carries this week. He'll get more carries because I don't think that Jordan Mason and TDP will play all that much in the playoffs. I think one of them will be inactive, actually, and the other one probably won't play all that much either. Seattle is who San Francisco will be playing. Seattle 
took an overtime game, a crazy overtime game. I mean, Jason Myers did hit the upright in regulation, but then goes and makes a kick in overtime. Then they also get the Lions to beat the Packers in the night game to get into the playoffs. So just a parlay of all parlays for Seattle, certainly not playing well, particularly Geno, I think. You know, we talked a lot about how well Geno was playing. The last month, it has not been good for Geno. Now he has to play San Francisco on the road in the playoffs. I'm a little worried about him. What do you see out of Seattle's narrow win over the Rams? I think the biggest takeaway at this point, I, I was really concerned about Tyler Lockett's health going into this game. I think he's healthy or he's he's getting healthier. Um, and I think that that's the biggest the, the, the biggest takeaway, because he is such a difference maker for their offense. Um, but, yeah, I mean, this wasn't the greatest offensive showing by any means. I mean, they're going to they're gonna continue to try to run run the crap out of the ball, I think, in, yeah. in their playoff game. Well, that's what I was going to say. Kenneth Walker's workload is kind of the stuff dreams are made of for fantasy. Yeah, he's only gotten four targets in his last three games, but his carry load the last three games, 29, 23, 26. That's what they're going to try to do against San Francisco. We'll see if they're successful. I'm curious your take on offensive rookie of the year. This is a really interesting race this year. I think Kenneth Walker has a really good case. His team made the playoffs. He was a big part of it. I think Tyler Algier as like a pure runner Mm -hmm. was awesome. And he deserves consideration. Mm -hmm. Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave were like awesome Mm -hmm. right away. Frontline NFL wide receivers. And then Brock Purdy's only started six games, Mm -hmm. but he's six and oh for one of the best teams in the NFL. So I, I think, well, I don't even, I don't even know who, who would your vote be for offense rookie year. Again, I think it's one of these five Walker, Algier, yeah. Garrett Wilson, Alave, or Purdy. I guess I had kind of like just penciled in Garrett Wilson uh, three or four weeks before the end of the regular season. I think Kenneth Murray caught him. Kenneth Walker. I think Ken- Kenneth Murray. <laughs> Kenneth Walker caught him. Um, Brock Purdy has an interesting case. It's just, I think it's just not enough. Just not enough games, mm-hmm. but man, I mean, he's absolutely in the mix. He's you—you you can't leave him out of the conversation. But I think that Kenneth Murray, Kenneth Walker, <laughs> um, I'm thinking of the Chargers linebacker, um, Kenneth Walker caught him, uh, yeah. caught caught Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave. But I don't know. It was a—it's a really good rookie class, though. It was supposed to be a really good rookie class, and I think it lived up to expectations. I mean. The way that Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson played as rookie wide receivers is awesome. Unfortunately, neither team has made the playoffs. Neither did Tyler Algier's team. And whether that should matter or not, I don't know. But I think from a voting perspective, it does matter to the voters. And so Kenneth Walker, again, a huge part of a playoff team. I do think he'll end up winning it. But man, they were all really good. Walker, Algier, Wilson, Olave. And then Purdy, to me, has not played enough games either. But we'll see. Tampa. So Tampa stayed true to their word, played the starters about a half. Then they went to Blaine Gabbert and Kyle Trask. Brady did his thing in the half. Very short passes, 17 attempts for 84 yards. The one usage note I wanted to make here, they rested playoff Lenny. Playoff Lenny only played three snaps. And then Lenny tweeted something like, oh, it's time for playoff Lenny or something like that. Like you saw what happened last year. Lenny was uh, massive in the playoffs. Maybe that was two years ago. Either way, Playoff Lenny, I think, will be a big, big factor. They are home versus the Cowboys in week one. We just talked about how the Cowboys defense has been getting flamed. I think pretty good spot here for the Bucs to get a win as a home dog in the playoffs. What do you see out of the Bucs? Any thoughts on them heading into the playoffs? Um, Not really. I did a, a DraftKings best ball, full playoffs, all the rounds draft um, earlier this morning. And I was very surprised at how late Chris Godwin went um, because I think that the Bucs are live to win this first game and he's an absolute machine on DraftKings. So I don't know, you know, that's a one, one draft, one off, extreme small sample. But um, I, I, I felt like I could pile up when, when I did this draft. I, th- I felt like I could pile up a ton of stud receivers. People were undervaluing them and overvaluing a lot of running backs. Uh, and then wind up with, you know, a stable of committee backs. There's a lot of committee running backs in these playoffs. And there's a lot of really good receivers. Um, And I I just – I was really surprised at how late Chris Godwin went. I mean, he went in like the fifth or sixth round of a six-team draft. Yeah, we – our playoff rankings are up. We have half PPR up for a normal format right now. We have Chris Godwin 32nd overall, and that's kind of dragged down by our expected games. So we have the Bucs expected to play 1.7 games 
here. And so that drags his ranking down a little bit. But the best way, I think, to be contrarian in these kind of formats is to IKB, I know better, the game's played. If you think the Bucks are definitely going to beat the Cowboys and they're going to play two games, and maybe they play three games or something like that, mm-hmm. then Chris Godwin's going to smash. So, yeah. you know, like IKB being the expected games played stuff is the way. Three games of Chris Godwin. I mean, we're talking 20, 25 catches. Like, I, I know his, late, his ADOT has been really low. He's not been playing, you know, he's not been making a lot of big plays, but the catches and targets have been there consistently, and that, that's not going to change. Let's go to the AFC with the Baltimore Ravens. Baltimore decided to lay down here and not uh, show anything to the Bengals, who they'll be facing in week in the wild card round this weekend. So Ravens rest all their guys. They did not rest Gus Edwards. He picked up a concussion. He'll be questionable. We'll see there. We'll also see on Lamar Jackson, obviously one of the biggest stories of the week. Will Lamar Jackson play? Will Tua Tagovailoa play? Right now, I kind of think Lamar gets back out there, but I don't feel strongly about that. The one thing I wanted to highlight from this Mm -hmm. game, though, we've been saying it since the preseason. If you watch the preseason, you saw Isaiah Likely, like one of the most dominant offensive players in the preseason. When he's gotten a chance in the regular season, he's been very good. But my fear before the season came true, like Mark Andrews is a move tight end. Isaiah Likely is a move tight end. They play like the exact same position. And so it was really hard for Isaiah Likely to get on the field all year. But he finally gets on the field here. He gets 13 targets from Anthony Brown and goes 8 one So I hope the Ravens find a way mm-hmm. to use this kid with Mark Andrews. They haven't done it all year, though. Evan, what do you think about the Ravens heading into a rematch with the Bengals? I think it's just it comes down to Lamar. And the early week comments from John Harbaugh have been noncommittal on whether or not Lamar is going to play this week. I just, he's such a I, he makes such a big of a difference. I mean, he's you know, I know people like Tyler Huntley for a minute. Anthony Brown is awful. Um, they need to get Lamar out there. I mean, yeah. and I think they could be a dangerous team if they get Lamar out there. Their defense has been sensational since they acquired Roquan Smith. They've got a good offensive line. You know, they were able to rest some starters in their in their regular season finale. They've got, um, you know, they've got Isaiah Likely. Um, you know, J.K. Dobbins is going to be back. Like, I think they're a dangerous team, but they have to have Lamar. Yeah, uh, and, you know, Lamar, uh, J.K. Dobbins, we've talked a lot about his knee. Like, giving him a week off was an absolute no-brainer here. And I think it, whether Gus Edwards plays or not, I think J.K. Dobbins will be ready to carry the load against Cincinnati. Bills had one of like the most emotional opening kickoffs for a touchdown anyone has ever seen. Obviously, all the DeMar Hamlin stuff. Sounds like he's going to be okay, which is great news. And then Naheem Hines takes the opening kickoff back for a touchdown. Later in the game, Naheem Hines took another kickoff back for a touchdown. And that kind of muted the number of plays that the Bills were able to get off. But Josh Allen still managed three touchdowns. Should have Could have had another. I think Gabe dropped one that could have gone for another touchdown. But yeah, I mean, Josh Allen didn't play great, especially in the first half. I don't think, but still ends up with 22, 23 fantasy points. What'd you see out of the Bills win over the Patriots, which both knocked the Patriots out of the playoffs and confirmed the number two seed for the Bills? It just feels like this team is a team of destiny and that they're on a mission. And, um, you know, it's not that they weren't going to play hard but uh, before the, the DeMar Hamlin thing, but like they're like on a mission. Um, yeah. So, are they the Super Bowl favorite right now? They're, they probably are not because they didn't get a first round buy, right? The Chiefs Correct. are? Yeah. Correct. Chiefs Chiefs are the favorite, but for best ball stuff, uh, I'm sorry, for playoff contest stuff, including best ball, Bill stuff we have ranked way better because their expected games is more. They play in yep. one. We have the Bills for 2.7 games here. We have the Chiefs for 2.0 games. Um, um, and I like they got Steph Diggs going. I mean, he had kind of had a slow final month of the season. Uh, they got him going with a big play, a really big, really big second half. He actually yeah. did. He didn't start that high, but he wound up getting where we wanted him to go in, in DFS. John, Smokey Brown came in and made a big play. Um, their running game has looked a lot better. I think James Cook is an interesting pick in yeah. these uh, in the DFS uh, playoff games. I, I was just going to mention that. So in this game, yeah. James Cook actually outsnapped Devin Singletary. He ran more routes than Devin Singletary, and he outtouched Devin Singletary. Now, part of that was Devin Singletary fumbled midway through the third quarter. After that, the touches were 5-1 in favor of James Cook. We'll see if that's sticky, but at a minimum, I I think we can project it pretty close to down the middle for James Cook versus Devin Singletary here in round one. Um, So, yeah, I like James Cook as a pick in these drafts also. One guy I wanted to ask you about was Gabe Davis. Gabe Davis did not have a great year, and we're going to go back and do some podcasts after the Super Bowl 
going through everything, what we got right, what we got wrong. I, I feel like we were kind of in line with the market with mm -hmm. Gabe Davis. The problem was the market was very hot on Gabe mm -hmm. Davis. He just did, he had all the opportunity. He just did not play well this year. His catch rate was absolutely brutal. I don't know if you have any long-term or macro thoughts on what happened to Gabe Davis this year. I think that, you know, we had Matt Harmon on before the season and I think Matt Harmon was probably right. I mean, Gabe Davis was not, you know, a highly touted prospect coming out of school. He, I think he was a fourth round pick. Um, he has been, you know, he was good when given opportunities in a, an extremely explosive high scoring offense. And, you know, as like a third receiver, I think that's probably what he is. He's probably a third receiver. Um, I think that you could look at the Bills offense and say that it's not that talented. It's it's actually not that talented because, I mean, look, you have Diggs and, and Josh Allen, and there's not a better quarterback receiver duo in the NFL probably than that, other than that, right? But, I mean, you've got kind of just guys at, at RB. I think you have a lot of just guys at wide receiver. I think Gabe Davis is probably just a guy, Isaiah McKenzie. Um, you know, Dawson Knox is is good in the red zone. Um, but, you know, he's not one of the best tight ends in the league or anything like that. Offensive line has been below average, I, I think I would say. And so they they really aren't – they're not hyper-talented on offense, but Allen and Diggs can get them there anyways. And the other guys are just – you know, they're all complementary role players. One thing I would say about Gabe Davis is like – same thing I say about DJ Chark. Like you're going to get five, six, maybe even seven targets deep down the field – from Josh Allen, you have a chance for big games. You don't have to be that good. The problem is it's not like it was not consistent at all this year, but nothing is stopping Gabe Davis, I don't think, from having big games in the playoffs. Cincinnati, you know, they, it wasn't the sharpest game from them. You know, they tried in the game. They played their starters the whole game so that they could earn that number three seed. Now they have a rematch against Baltimore starters this time in wild card week. That game will be Sunday night anything for you on the Bengals as they get set to play the Ravens once again um I just they're healthy right now except they lost Alex Kappa uh stud guard I think he's done for the playoffs um and I think that that is could be a potentially significant injury um but other than that I mean they're one of the healthier healthiest teams in the playoffs um uh, you know with Chase and Boyd and and Mixon and T Higgins and Burrow all rolling you know, even though P. Ryan continues to play and, and eat into a bunch of Joe Mixon snaps, Joe Mixon remains very good in the pass game, and Joe Burrow continues to throw at a high volume there. Another five catches on five targets in this game, Week 18. For Joe Mixon, I mean, he smashed all his career highs in receiving stuff, even though he only played 14 games this year. 60 catches on 75 targets in 14 games for Joe Mixon this year. He is a big part of the pass game, which certainly helps, even if he's mostly playing in base. Jaguars. This was a crazy game, man. So, of course, they played for this win and you're in game against the Titans. Jacksonville outscores the Titans 10-0 in the fourth quarter, including a game-winning fumble return touchdown with five minutes left, which gave them the lead. But it was not a good game for Travis Etienne. It was not a good game for Evan Ingram. Zay wasn't great either in a really good matchup. Now they face the Chargers in the playoffs. What do you think of that Saturday night performance by the Jaguars, Evan? Well, um, Zay wasn't very good, um, you know, in the in the stat sheet. But man, Trevor Lawrence missed him for a wide open touchdown. I mean, threw it ten feet above his head, and Zay Jones was wide open in the end zone. So we might be talking about him a little differently if they had connected on that. Um, I didn't really think that they were going to have any kind of a big offensive effort. Uh, it's a good matchup against the Titans, went you know for receivers and pass catchers and, and that. And Christian Kirk had an awesome game. Um, and, and Zay Jones would have had a be better game. Ingram caught everything that was thrown his way. But, I mean, the Titans had been, like, almost, almost resting dudes, mm -hmm. and, and then all, they were all back in the final game. So I'm not surprised that ETN struggled or anything like that. Um, it, it was a, a low-scoring game, and I think it was expected to be a low-scoring game. They did such a good job, though, to reiterate against Derrick Henry. He had 30 carries along of 14. That's winning. Yeah, uh, the, That's winning against Derrick Henry. Yeah, and we'll talk more. I think it's a really interesting game, this Jaguars-Chargers game. We'll talk more about that game on Friday. Uh, Friday is going to be established the show this week for subscribers. We'll break down every game from a DFS perspective. Chiefs. So Chiefs on Saturday, as expected, played all out to win 
the game because it locked up the number one seed and the bye for them. I think this game, even though Mahomes wasn't great on Saturday, I think it cements his MVP case. You know, the team just isn't that good. I mean, they're not like Mm -hmm. their receivers aren't that great. Their defense isn't that great. They're still 14 and three. And the craziest part to me of the Mahomes argument after losing Tyreek Hill, which undoubtedly Tyreek Hill, one of the best wide receivers in the NFL, after losing Tyreek Hill, a lot of Mahomes' underlying stats, advanced stats, are actually better, which is absolutely insane to me. So mm-hmm. I get that, you know, I, I'm rooting for Jalen Hurts still. I have that 40 to 1. Joe Burrow, I think, has a case. Josh Allen has a case. But to me, it almost has to be Mahomes. Who's your MVP pick right now, Evan? And any thoughts on the Chiefs as they get set for their bye? It's been my homes for me for a while. So I'm sticking by that. Um, Kadarius Tony is, I, I I didn't look at his on-field participation yeah. stuff. I know it's not super high. No. But, and but and when, I, he, when he's in the game, though, they're getting him the rock. Like, well, look, is, yeah. in this game, though, they didn't have Sky Moore. And they didn't have McCole Hardman. Right. And right. and they only still ran the ball. Or they only gave Kadarius Tony six routes. I mean, Justin Watson ran 18 routes. And then MVS, who has had a pretty bad year. Juju, who's been up and down. I mean, they just don't want to give Kadarius Tony routes. I assume Sky and Miko will be back for the They're playoffs. They're using him also. as a gadget player. Yeah, he got three carries. He right. got three carries. Right. Yeah, and he had a, another touchdown called back. Other than I think he scored the next, uh, the very next play. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I, when he when he's in the game, like, they're trying to get him the ball. Will his snaps go up in the playoffs? I mean, I kind of expect them to, even if Sky Moore and McCall Hardman come back. He's like the most dynamic player in their offense right now. Kelsey really hasn't done a whole lot for a while. Yeah, I, and I, I hope they unleash Kadarius Tony some. It's just it's just hard. It's wish casting a, a little bit. I mean, he just has not had a real role since he's been in Kansas City. But we'll see. We'll see. I mean, Sky and Miko, I think will have. Well, definitely Miko. I don't know if Sky will have a role. I could see Sky playing zero snaps in that playoff game. Chargers. So I don't know what Brandon Staley was doing, man. Like uh, Brandon Staley's made a lot of questionable decisions for a lot of times for much of the year that I think has not done any favors to the Chargers. I thought he was doing some good stuff, especially on the fourth down stuff last year. At least he was being aggressive. But yeah, I mean, it has not been pretty for Brandon Staley. And like, okay, you want to come out and say that you want to play your guys because you want them to stay sharp. You want continuity. That's fine. Don't come out and say that, well, we couldn't rest anyone because we have to play 48 guys. Look at what the Giants did. Look what the Vikings did. Look what the Bucks did. I mean, right. you can get away with not playing your guys. And also, I would hope he understands there's a ton of data out there how much how much value there is in rest. I mean, just rest, period. Teams coming off of rest is good for teams, period. It's like very clear in the data. So I don't know, man. I was shocked they played their stars, but they did. So we got another look at them. What do you think of the Chargers? Yeah, just really surprised at that decision. I mean... And, and if there's anybody that you would rest, wouldn't it be like Mike Williams who yeah. winds up getting hurt in the game? I guess Brandon Staley says he's going to be fine. Sounds like back spasms, but yeah, he's probably. Yeah, I mean, yeah. he's got a, a history of back stuff and, yeah. and back and neck stuff. He had a neck injury in college. Um, Austin Eckler also seemed like the perfect guy to, to rest, but mm-hmm. they wound up playing him quite a bit. Um, you know, Keenan Allen had the full season hamstring injury, essentially. You know, I. I, I don't get it, man. I, he's like Brandon Staley on tilt. I, I swear, I, I thought he was like a really smart guy. I know. It was, a, it was a very weird decision. The good news, though, is that Keenan seemed to stay healthy, and Keenan is just absolutely eating. I mean, this guy is dominating right now. We're going to have a big Keenan projection, I'm sure, when projections come out on Thursday. But, yeah, I mean, Keenan's just smashing, and it has been great for Eckler's past game role. I think Mark had a tweet, you know, when Keenan had missed that week, so I think it was weeks two through ten, Eckler's target share was 22%. Last seven weeks with Keenan back, Eckler's target share down to 14.6%. So that kind of short area role, Keenan has been eating more than Eckler. They also lost Joey Bosa in this game. We'll see on his status ahead of the Jacksonville playoff game. Speaking of injuries, as we go to Miami, Raheem Mostert broke his thumb in this game. We'll see if he's able to play, but that is one to watch. But yeah, I don't really know how they won this game. They had Skylar Thompson out there. Against Joe Flacco, it was a – Flacco was so bad. I mean, I actually do know how Miami won the game. Flacco was so, so, so bad. I'm skeptical Tua is going to be back for this game at the Bills. But they could get Teddy Bridgewater back, and that will at least give them some chance, I think. But, man, they're drawing thin to win against Buffalo with the state of their roster. What do you think about the Dolphins' performance against the Jets as they head into the playoffs? Yeah, I mean, it's not 
there's not a whole lot of, of analysis. This was a Skylar Thompson versus Joe Flacco game. Um, the biggest thing is the most certain injury. Yeah. Um, if he can't play like Jeff Wilson, probably gets a pretty big workload against Buffalo. Not the easiest matchup, but you know, I I, I think that Jeff Wilson is probably going to get a big workload regardless. Actually. Yeah. And I mean, if Mostert plays, we see Mostert have big passing games. When you come, when you play with a broken thumb as a running back, typically you're just in there to run the football, um, mm-hmm. not to catch it. So we'll have our eye on that ahead of Friday's show and lock on Saturday. All right, that is going to do it for this team by team playoff preview. Appreciate all you being here all season. We'll continue these pods through the playoffs. Be sure you are subscribed. If you're listening on the YouTube machine, be sure you're subscribed to our email list. Be sure you're subscribed on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this. Also, we will have content throughout the offseason, most of which will be free. For Evan, for Bruce Luke, I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.